three. Welcome back to another interview series with THC Legal Group. Today we are going to be speaking with Rod Knight, an attorney um, who specializes, of course, in cannabis, and hopefully this will be interesting. So, Rod, thank you for joining us. How, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great, Abe, and I appreciate you having me. And just for clarification, and it's a very common um, mistake, and I, I usually answer anything, but I, it's actually kite. K- oh, K-H-T. I apologize. Okay. Ah, that. excellent. Uh, but thanks, I'm, I'm actually doing great. Uh, it's a nice, beautiful day here in Asheville, and I'm excited to be speaking with you. Beautiful. Okay, so yeah, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you do. Of course, you're an attorney, but you know, um, you, you've know, you written a book on cannabis law, which is particularly interesting and unique for the industry. So, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you got into the law industry, and of course, into cannabis specifically. Sure, absolutely. Well, I... Um, Briefly, I've been practicing law since 1999. I'm, I'm currently licensed in North Carolina, and I any day now I expect to be licensed in Oregon. I'm just waiting to hear back from the okay. signature from the Supreme Court there. But I've been practicing since 1999. I, I grew up in, in South Carolina, went to school, both undergrad and law school in South Carolina. Moved to Asheville, which is a beautiful, wonderful um, liberal, cultural, artistic community, and, and love it here, uh-huh. and started practicing any number of areas. I'm, I've been a sole proprietor for 15 years, had my own firm, and, and wanted to ex, you know explore every area of law that I could so I could find my niche. And my niche um, up until recently has been bankruptcy and business law. And uh, the way that I got into cannabis law is that I've, I've always been an advocate. But about five years ago, I had testicular cancer, wow. and I, I went through chemotherapy, and it was a very difficult ordeal. I'm, I'm in remission, and it's all good, and it was a, a, actually a, a very transformative piece of my life. But um, I, I used cannabis uh, medically, and I was I was actually stunned at at the the help that it gave me. I didn't frankly expect it to. I'd read that it can help with nausea and pain and, and all the other you know symptoms of of chemotherapy, and I tried it just thinking, oh, why not? I have nothing to lose, and it, it really did help immensely, and that made me um, decide that I really needed to be a public advocate for it, that this really is a medicine, uh-huh. and, and so I became an advocate, became a, an attorney advocate for normal. I don't do criminal defense work, and so my advocacy mostly was, um, you know, legislative and, and, and little bits and pieces that I could, because at that point in time, normal was mostly focused on helping people who were charged with cannabis crimes. Right. Um, I've written some books on bankruptcy law uh, for the, uh, a subsidiary of Thomson Reuters, which is a big legal publishing group, and they contacted me, and and I had you know been pursuing this business aspect of cannabis and, and trying to put together the, the laws for my own head, and I pitched this book to them, and I said, you know, uh, what I've discovered in my research is that there is no legal book on cannabis business law. There's there's blogs and there's little postings and bits and tidbits everywhere, but there's not a comprehensive source of where cannabis law is right now. So I'd like to write a book about it. And fortunately, they accepted, and, and I, I spent about nine months researching and, and writing the book that was released about a year ago. And it's um, it's exciting. Wow. And to answer your question as to why or, or, or what I'm doing and why I'm in it besides the advocacy piece, as an attorney, uh, cannabis law has has a lot to it. Um, you know, any kind of any kind of industry, as you're aware, has its own rules and regulations. Whether you're a, an attorney in the helping uh, at auto dealerships or pharmacies or you know hairstylists, there there, there are certain um, regulations and, yeah. and, and norms in that industry. Cannabis is, is no exception, and in fact has quite a bit of regulations and, and conflicting laws and gray areas, and it's also evolving rapidly. And to me, that's just highly stimulating. Even if I wasn't an advocate, per se, I, I would love the legal hmm. aspect of it. And so it's just been a perfect practice area, and I enjoy advising my business clients. Well, one of the questions that we've gotten, um, both from informed clients and also from other attorneys, uh, is kind of how to go about reconciling a an attorney's duty to his ethics and professional rules of responsibility as, you know, laid out by whichever bar uh, he's governed by, whatever state he's practicing in, um, and the federal uh, 
regulation of cannabis and classification as a substance one drug. So, you know, how do you tend to look at this kind of precarious position that an attorney is in where his state may in fact say that cannabis is now legal, whether under a medicinal framework or even under a full recreational framework, um, and his professional duties of responsibility where federal law still says that it's an illegal substance. Do you have any thoughts or feelings about that? I do. I mean, this is something I've looked into quite a bit, as you might imagine. Yeah, I, so so the, the question is, is about, you know, as, as a lawyer violating ethical duties by adv- advising clients to conduct business under w- when that business is, is federally illegal. Certainly, you know, if I, uh, in a state where there is, uh, is no cannabis reform whatsoever, uh, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to advise a client to do any kind of business. Um, but in the states where it has been legalized, um, you know, you can advise your clients within the boundary of the state law so long as you, as you advise them that it is, in fact, uh, federally illegal. Now, there's most states that have enacted um, some sort of cannabis reform have an opinion to that effect. Uh-huh. Uh, as Ohio just just released an opinion that was the opposite of that, and that's causing some, some controversy and some stir, and I, I think personally that's going to change. That's the, right. As, uh, well, you know, we're yeah, in Ohio. We're, 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 we're in the... We're in the thick of the, of the mud of this decision right at this very moment. So, <laughs> I, I bet I'd, I'd, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on yeah. it. You know, when you we, we had a chance to talk about that in detail. But you know, as lawyers, our duty is to advise our clients of what the law is, what the parameters of the law, and and so to, the idea that, that that by advising clients to do something that's legal while while giving them the parameters, uh, that that would somehow be a violation of our ethical duty, I think is is I, th- I think that we have an, uh, an obligation and a duty to serve our clients and to and and cl- business clients, particularly in a highly regulated industry, need good advice. So Ohio's decision uh, essentially just says, "Well, good luck. <laughs> you right. can't use a lawyer and and and, and best to you." So I think that it, that's why it will have to change. Uh, you, you know, uh, to, but, as an extra kind of layer of uh, confusion, th- these. Advisory opinions are, you know, by their very nature, just at least officially advisory. So they are not binding. They are meant to kind of guide attorneys. But, you know, many attorneys feel that they're only opinions in as much as when the mafia gives you its opinion of, of what you're supposed to be doing. You know, it's an offer that you can't really refuse. <laughs> but, but, right, if, right, exactly. So yeah. even though it's non binding. Right. Well, what what exactly it means for an Ohio Supreme Court opinion to be non-binding is uh, kind of a strange uh, legal theory question, and many lawyers are skeptical of its insignificance more than anything else, I think. I, th- I think you're exactly right about that. And, you know, fortunately, the laws, you know, it seems like every week or certainly every month there's there's some new – something new happens, whether it be a case that comes down or an updated statute or a state comes up online that I think helps move the, the – matters forward. And, and recently, I'm sure you were of the McIntosh decision, right. where it said that, you know, the, the, the Fed said you can't use federal funding, the DEA, the, the Justice Department in general can't use federal funding to to interfere with the cannabis trade in states w- that have legalized it against actors who are within the bounds of state law. Right. Now, as a lawyer, you know, we can, we can discuss from a philosophical standpoint, you know, whether a law that can't be enforced is actually a law or not. I right. Mean, the technical piece is, it's a law, but it can't be enforced. Well, from a practical matter, I think that's really important, and it goes through this discussion. You know, you're saying, okay, well, well, you're under, you're acting within the bounds of your state law. So, as an attorney, we can advise clients, and then we can also say, on the one hand, it, you know, this substance is a controlled substance and it's illegal. On the other hand, you can't be prosecuted as long as this funding measure, this omnibus spending bill, or whatever you know the the, the bill at issue is, uh, is in place. And now that may change, but you are okay. And I think that that's important and vital to our profession to yeah. be able to, to, to advise clients in that respect. Yeah, I, I think to a large extent this issue in its entirety is really just a microcosm for some of the broader concerns that, let's say, civilians have about the legal industry, that it's full of caveats and um, subtext and uncertainty, and the language that is used to promulgate many of these laws seem to be engineered almost to cause confusion and ambiguity. So, 
I think it was it's on a Thursday. Dream, right? <laughs> right, it was a lawyer's dream. You know, I, I think even at the end of last week, I think maybe it was Thursday or Friday, the Ohio Supreme Court came out and said, well, we're actually going to review our advisory opinion because of some of the backlash that we've gotten and concern from lawyers. Um, you know, how could it be that Ohio could both simultaneously pass a law legalizing the medicinal use of marijuana and simultaneously barring an attorney to actually push forth any sort of actualization of that law. Um, it's just full of double talk and uh, almost reckless uncertainty. It is reckless. And I like that idea. And, you know, I say a lawyer, you know, dream facetiously because, it, you know, you have the situation in particular in Ohio where you have a, a thicket of gray and contradictory laws and then the Ohio Supreme Court says, well, best of luck to you because you can't have a lawyer. And, and what that does is effectively nullify the law, right. um, at least in its practical aspect, aspect because who, who, is, who in their right mind would just set up a business and try to navigate these laws on their own without the help of an attorney? And so it really it, – it, it prohibits the law from going into effect at least as broadly and roundly as it should. It's very strange. It's very strange. Um, well, you, of course, have a lot of experience in many different areas of cannabis law. Which one do you find to be most interesting and perhaps um, as a necessary corollary most challenging? That's a, a great, great question. I, because of being licensed in North Carolina, we have a, a hemp law that's, that's um, actually – being implemented right now. It's not fully developed. There's a commission to be appointed. And so I've really been focused on that a lot lately. And and the big piece of the hemp law that I've been working on lately has to do with CBD, the cannabidiol. Uh -huh. And and all the the issues that emanate from, from CBD, you know, it, it what, in, in what respects is it legal and um, if with respect to you know the DEA, different state agencies, the FDA, and that has a particular eye on, on CBD. And so I find that it's, uh, of the in the cannabis world, uh, CBD is one of the most um, confusing pieces of of the legal world of uh, issues, I guess, that, that exist. And so I've really enjoyed. Um, fleshing out the CBD laws as, as I mm. see them because th there are a lot of contradictory um, laws and, and opinions about it and from a state agencies and from federal agencies and, and whatnot. And I've, I'm working on, uh, on a theory about it right now that I call the source theory, and it just says that essentially that CBD is legal or not primarily based on its source, right. which is bizarre because the same compound could be legal um, – or not, again, depending on whether it came from abroad or from a state that allows it. Is it from hemp? Is it from cannabis? And so right. I've enjoyed fleshing all that out. And, so, and, and there comes a point a lot of times where you, you, there is no solid answer. I just have to say this is my best guess. The road ends here. Um, we'll take a logical step and, and, and hope that it's right. But, but there are some laws and there are a lot of good guidelines that I, I've enjoyed piecing together. Well, you know, from a commercial matter and for a sports enthusiast, um, this question was raised even as recently as – Saturday night during a UFC fight, an Ultimate Fighting Championship bout, where the loser of the main event, Nate Diaz, was up on stage um, smoking, or, or not smoking, but <laughs> using a vaporizer, and when asked what was in the vaporizer, he said CBD oil, and suddenly the internet was just abuzz with questions, not only of whether or not CBD would trigger um, the USADA regulations, you know, the, the Drug Association, right. which manages some of the sporting events, but also what the legal impl implications are. And, you know, there's just a, a massive amount of, uh, of traffic questioning how one should even conceive of the legality or illegality in relation to the perceived illegality or legality of, you know, traditional THC-laden cannabis. So, um, so for for I'm our not, users, I missed that. I missed yeah, that. I'm glad. I'll have to check that out. That, because it does. There, there's so many issues that can that can come about. Where where did he get his CBD? Is right. it legal? And, and then how does that play into the the rules for the um you know for the UFC and so on and so forth? Exactly. Right. That's, well, well. So for our user, so many of our listeners, of course, are, are um, interested in this topic, but may not be familiar kind of in, in that great of detail how one goes about distinguishing CBD from THC in a legal capacity. So is it fair to say that 
CBD is not necessarily legal, although it's not illegal? Or how would you go about in, in a elevator pitch, kind of very briefly explaining how we can kind of think about CBD in a, in a legal sense? Sure. So we got five floors to ride up. I'll, I'll give my little pitch there. Okay, five so floors CBD, is enough time. Of course, for, yeah, that, that's a great, uh, that's a, a, a good question, a way to summarize it. So CBD, for those uh, that, that aren't aware, is one of the many cannabinoids within the cannabis plant. It's non-psychoactive. It has what appear to be a lot of medicinal qualities, and it is one of the big uh, pieces of the, of the larger cannabis picture that is, that is emerging and you can you just google cbd and you'll find you know 10 million hits so uh cbd i, I break it down into its legality into, into two branches of the tree one is the branch of the tree of, of cbd that is cultivated or extracted from from industrial hemp from outside the united states um, by and large that cbd is legal and that's based on some opinions from the 90s and i should the little caveat here is when I talk about CBD, uh, most of this comes from a logical extension of hemp. Uh, hemp is a is a is really the cannabis plant, but it's a low THC um, plant that, that tends to, industrial hemp tends to look different from the smaller, bushier um, marijuana plants. It's all the same plant, and, and there's a legal distinction, and I won't go into that right now. But in any event, um, hemp itself was legalized for import back in the 90s through a couple of cases called the Hemp Industries cases. So it was. So that, just interrupt for a moment. So so hemp was legal only. So th- this also seems to be kind of strikingly peculiar. The plant, of course. Um, does not change whether or not it's grown within the United States or outside of the United States. You know, of course, there might be some minor chemical differences, but but the idea is that essentially it's the same plant, but merely by virtue of the fact that it is grown external to the United States and imported versus being grown internal and then just kind of produced, that is a demarcating factor in its legality. Is that right? Absolutely, I, I would I would stand by that to the to the end. Yeah, wow, there's the, these two paths: the domestic versus international. Wow, so inter, inter, international. You know, CBD sourced from hemp internationally is legal throughout the United States, and, and clients of mine who want to distribute um, CBD online throughout the United States, that's really the only viable at this moment way of doing it. Uh-huh. It's the only way to ensure that what you're doing is, is legal. Uh-huh. The other branch of the tree is the one that we're more interested in because it's our United States economy and right. domestic hemp and that and that is domestically sourced hemp. So uh, in Congress enacted the, the U.S. Farm Bill. Every several years they'll re-up the Farm Bill and it's thousands of pages long having to deal with everything agricultural. And in a, just like a it's section 7606, I think it's three or four pages, it allowed states to enact um, uh, pilot programs for, for hemp research and development. And what it said, it didn't legalize hemp throughout the United States. It just said uh, states can legalize it. And as long as their laws are compliant with this Section 7606, which is fairly generic, actually, um, then hemp is legal in its products, by extension, within that state. And a lot of states have done this. California, mm. Oregon, South Carolina, Kentucky, so on and so forth. I believe it's in the mid-20s now, so how many states have done it. And so, the, so hemp in those states is legal and CBD is legal in those states. And I've got clients who grow hemp in, say, South Carolina, extract the CBD, sell it in South Carolina, perfectly legal on a federal and state level. The issue becomes when they want to cross state lines. Right. Could a state where it's not legal. Right. Well, could an individual within a state where it's not legal import it from a state where it is legal? And that's the question. And before December of this past year, so less than a year ago, it was categorically no. It uh-huh. couldn't happen. Well, what happened in, in December was Congress passed a spending bill, and in a very small little clause, it said that um, no federal funds could be used to essentially interfere. There's some language, you know, interfere with production and um, whatnot, but could interfere with, with hemp um, so long as it was produced um, under a state law that was compliant with a federal law, and, and 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 crucially, it said even in states that have not enacted such laws. Uh-huh. And so this goes back to our discussion, you know, for example, in the McIntosh decision or the MAM decision, and out of um, the, you know, San Francisco in the Ninth Circuit, that says that, you know, okay, so maybe it's it is illegal to transport it to the other state line, but no federal funds can be used to interfere with that. So effectively, from a practical standpoint. It is legal. And so that, from again, from a practical standpoint, opened up the doors to be able to take 
you know, CBD from, say, South Carolina, where it's, as long as it's grown legally there, or Kentucky, and to ship it all over the United States. The, the, the key problem with that is that some states still have cannabis prohibition across the board. They haven't enacted medical marijuana laws. They haven't enacted um, hemp laws. And so you still may be violating a state law. So and if you're – if you, uh-huh. Yeah, so, so if you're within a state where no marijuana um, regulation has been passed or no, regula- uh, no marijuana legalization scheme um, has been instituted, let's say you're in Alabama, I think off the top of my head, that's still com- it's still completely illegal there if I'm not mistaken, right? right? Um, right. So even there, you would not be able to import CBD from a foreign country. Is that right? You could import it from a foreign country. You could import it's legal. It's legal federally, and, and the supremacy clause applies because the the, um, the hemp industry's cases said this is legal. You know, if there's trace elements of naturally occurring THC in hemp products, that's okay. But domestically sourced CBD would be illegal in Alabama. It's not. It, it couldn't be prosecuted using federal funds. So the, the DEA couldn't stop it from going into Alabama. But Alabama, presumably under its laws could step in and prosecute, and the reason the Supremacy Clause, um, and for those of the listeners that aren't, you know, versed right. in constitutional law, right. um, federal laws trump state laws, essentially, if they're conflicting, but the reason the Supremacy Clause is not um, is not triggered in this situation is because Congress didn't say um, hemp and CBD are legal, it just said federal funds can't be used to um, interfere, and so it, it's it, that's a little bit of a distinction there. Right. So the feds aren't going to prosecute you, or at least they're not allowed to prosecute you, but the state authorities can. And and it, unless uh, right, they right. receive federal funds as well, which most states do. And so it can kind of get really tricky. And so I've had clients um, who've asked for opinion letters, and they and I have to look into it. And I say, well, you know, it, it's illegal in this state, but the state does receive federal funds for these particular programs. And so the, the likelihood of being prosecuted um, is... Right. Practically zero, or we, we would argue that they're not allowed to prosecute because they receive federal funds. You know, I so think there's a really... yeah. Well, you know, I think also there there is a seminal case kind of going through exactly what sort of impositions the federal government can make on the on the state government under the supremacy clause. I, I believe it was New York versus United States, or maybe United States versus New York. I, I can't quite remember. Um, yeah, but but essentially the idea is not only, uh, of course the. the the merit of the supremacy clause, is, I think, is fairly incontrovertible at this point. But the question is, does the state, does the United States government have the ability to force the state to use its own internal resources to enforce a federal law, even if they don't necessarily um, want to? So, can the United well, States, right? Yeah, can the United States government force a state to impose certain, to use its resources to crack down on, let's say, certain gun regulations that? The federal government wants done, and, and the answer is, is likely a resounding no. And you know, the government may kind of uh, strike a deal where, under a quid pro quo schema, they compel the state to do it. Well, you know, w- with the stick of withholding federal funding if, if they don't do it. But there's there's a bevy of interesting constitutional questions here, definitely. There are, and it's exciting. And, and what's you know. It's all, all of this, it's my belief that all of this will begin to smooth out and, and begin to reconcile as, you know, again, more states come online, as, as the federal laws continue to evolve. And so I like to think that, say, five years from now, this conversation uh, will mostly be um, historical. You uh-huh. know, remember back in the days when we had to deal with the source theory of CBD, depending on its source. Well, we're so happy we don't have to deal with that anymore. Or, you know, we're, we're you know, marijuana itself is, is – is, is, Move down the list in the scheduling, or, or remove from scheduling altogether. Yeah, and because it, you know, as you know, it deals. You know, there are tax issues, there are banking issues, uh-huh. and all sorts of problems the current regime creates. Well, uh, you know, as we're moving into this last segment of our interview, I, I really just want to focus on, on this one kind of issue that we've um, briefly kind of mentioned and, and alluded to throughout, um, and kind of have you explain to our listeners how we can kind of appreciate some of these deeper federalism issues in light of the Macintosh decision. So, you know, tell us a little bit about the Macintosh decision. You know, what it means practically for an individual who is doing something that's statewide legal but federally illegal and how they should potentially um, 
uh, at least think of an anticipatory response by the government, given the McIntosh's ruling um, about the law enforcement's actual implementation of that federal law. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure, happy to do it. And I won't, I won't go into the, the details. I'll, I think it's easier just to use some simple sort of fact patterns and then sort of impose the, the holding in, in Macintosh on that fact pattern. Okay. So um, cannabis, as we all know, is, is, is a Schedule One substance. It's federally illegal, uh, and that remains the case to this day. But but different states have taken the initiative and, and created – state laws where, where it is legal. And so, for example, in Colorado, that's the most notable example, uh, it is legal to um, to sell both medical and what they call recreational. Uh-huh. I understand that term, recreational, but it right. is what it is. Right. Uh, that's the term that's used. In any event, with the, you, can, you can buy it with, or sell it without a, a medical you know, recommendation. In any event, um, and so as long as you're compliant with Colorado's laws, uh, you're, you're not going to be prosecuted by – um, by the, any Colorado authorities, and right. you're okay there. The problem is, um, when we talk about federalism, is we're governed by two different um, authorities. We've got the state authority, then we've got the federal authority. And because it's illegal federally, the feds can still come in and say, we don't care that you're perfectly in compliance with, with Colorado's laws and that you are um, a model citizen and a model business. We're going to prosecute you, and moreover, we're going to take your you know, assets, and they're going to be forfeited because you are violating federal law. Uh-huh. And that's, that's always been the issue. And what Congress has done, I guess it's dipping its, its big toe in the water, is it has enacted some budget bills that say um, that federal funds cannot be used to prosecute individuals or businesses or interfere with them as long as they're compliant with their own state's laws. And most of the budget bills that we're, we're talking about actually specifically state which states that they're talking about. They, they, they don't, they're not as generic as saying federal funds. They'll say federal funds to Colorado or federal funds to California or, or whatnot. And so um, the idea being that if you are state compliant, even though you're out of compliance with the, um, with, with the federal law, the, the feds are not allowed to prosecute you. And the issue in McIntosh and also um, MAM, um, the Marin – Alliance, I'm, I'm, I'm right. with the acronym standard. Sure, but, you sure, know, the case yeah. out of San Francisco is that federal funds were withheld pursuant to a funding bill, and the, and the Justice Department through the DEA and the U.S. attorneys went ahead and prosecuted. And, and the defendants said, you can't do this. You don't have the funds. Any funds that you're using are, are, um, are illegal because Congress says you can't use them to prosecute us. Therefore, we can't be prosecuted. So dismiss the case. And just, and well, just held that. Yeah. So j- just interject for a brief moment. Was this case um, litigated before the U.S. Supreme Court, or what? What court and, and under which authority were these decisions um, issued? Did it go all the way to the that's top? A, that's that's a great question. So it did not. The Supreme Court has not weighed in on this. In, in our federal system, we have the, the federal courts have district courts, right. which are, we, we sort of call them trial level courts. And right. Several of those, lots of those throughout the state. Then there are um, circuit courts, which cover their sort of mini Supreme Courts. They right. cover a block of states or an area. And then the Supreme Court is the the, the, the one court that decides them all. The highest and court so, of the land. Um, <laughs> the, the highest court of the land. Yeah. And the the Mam case was a district court decision by oh. Judge Breyer, who is the um, I think the son of former Justice Justice Breyer. Breyer. Court. And then the um, and that was the district court level. And the McIntosh um, court, I believe, was the Ninth Circuit. And you may know better than I. It was actually a circuit court, so it's the highest court in the land that has decided this issue. And that that carries a lot of precedent, certainly within the Ninth Circuit block of cases. But circuit court cases tend to be at least if they're not um, uh, directly precedent for the, um, for a state, are certainly giving quite a bit of weight in other circuits. Right. And the Ninth Circuit is the first court um, circuit to and, and for And issue. for our listeners, the, the reason why that's the case is because the justice system in this country has a principle of stare decisis, which means that we want to let a precedent stand. As soon as the court issues some sort of statement or a decision, a precedent, Future courts will look to see what that previous court has said, and it will greatly influence how they will rule in the future. And, of course, the courts are remiss to contradict earlier opinions by their contemporaries um, and colleagues, but uh, but certainly from uh, judges who've ruled um, in the past. And that's kind of an important thing to know. The reason why we really want to be looking out for these important court decisions is because it guides how different decisions will be made in the future. 
That's exactly right. And and because this was the Ninth Circuit, I, I just pulled up the Macintosh case while we we're talking so uh -huh. that I could uh, address some details if we need to get into it. But um, it, it it was the Ninth Circuit, and from a from a procedural standpoint, there's a lot of procedural details that I think would probably bore the tears out of most. Yeah, of the I think so. Um, <laughs> but it was a consolidated. Um, a lot of people were being prosecuted, and they all brought up this issue and and asked the Ninth Circuit to to address it, and and they consolidated all these cases into one case called the McIntosh case for purposes of presenting this issue. And the Ninth Circuit did rule in the defendant's favor and said that as long as these laws are in effect prohibiting the Justice Department from from using funds to interfere or to prosecute, then they can't interfere or prosecute. Uh, there's an open question as to what, what happens if you're, A, not compliant with your state's laws, and, and that most people assume that you can be prosecuted. And the, the more detailed question is, well, how do you even determine whether or not you're in compliance with state laws? Can federal be funds be used to prosecute a case where they argue that you're not um, um, in compliance with state laws? And that's an open question that they're going to look into. But, but the big picture is that federal funds can't be used to interfere with people who are compliant with their state laws, at least as of right now. So basically what I've gathered from that summation, which, which I thought was spot on for my own recollection, but if you are in a state which has passed um, some sort of permissive marijuana legal schema, either medicinal or recreational, as long as you are following the laws of that state, you should not necessarily be too concerned, given this Macintosh decision, of the DOJ or uh, a different federal government body swooping in and, and exact, exacting some kind of federal justice on your business. Is, is that fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. And just for um, to, to put this into perspective, you and I are talking. It's today. It's August twenty third. I'm not sure what, when this will broadcast. But the opinion was filed and or delivered August sixteenth. So literally one week ago. So this is this is brand new. Wow. The law itself, the statute has been there, but this is a court deciding in the statute and, and specifically state saying what that statute means. And yep, you're 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 spot on. If you're in a state that allows it and you're compliant with your it allows cannabis and um, sales or use or whatever, and you're compliant with your state laws, the, the federal government cannot mm. come in and prosecute you, notwithstanding the fact that it's federally illegal. You know, like, like a good deal of other constitutional law, th this really does feel like a, a game of power, where Congress is jockeying for power, the federal um, Supreme Court is jockeying for power, each side um, kind of wants to overrule the other in, in a certain way, and it kind of harkens back to that uh, most famous constitutional case of Marbury v. Madison, um, where we're, we're just trying to figure out, it's, it's a game of, in this game of thrones, you know, who will win? And, <laughs> right. and, and what's so funny is yeah. politics too, is because, you know, Congress could absolutely tomorrow pass a law legalizing marijuana and end all of this. Right. And it's, it's not able to do that because of politics. What it's able to do is slip in these little funding bills, right. things that kind of go unnoticed where there's not a whole lot of political capital that's being waged. Right. Um, court, in those situations, courts are, are in our system typically the uh, because judges are, um, are are appointed for life. They, they don't expending political capital is not such a big deal, so they're able to issue these decisions that that are, are, are pretty widespread. Hmm. Um, and also, frankly, the, I think the executive power through the president. Um, the executive branch could also deschedule marijuana, or could just uh, President Obama could say, "We're not going to uh, prosecute these crimes." Yeah, and, uh, and we've and, certainly and seen, that, yeah, we, we've seen nods to that effect from the Obama administration to the DOJ to kind of, you know, look the other way a little bit and don't put too much capital or manpower into prosecuting these cases. Um, right, and, and, and the, the letter, you know, the different memos, the Ogden memos, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a, there was some guidance, but this said, no, you, you don't have. Congress has said to the Justice Department, you don't have any uh, any discretion over this. You can't maybe prosecute, you may, maybe not prosecute. You're not allowed to use federal funds, period. And so this really clarified the issue for for us. And, 
we still have to deal with all the issues having to do with taxation and banking, and, and there are a host of other legal issues. But this was one that was, at least for now, put put to bed. Put to bed. Nice to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. We know you're you're a very busy man, um, and we really appreciate your time on here. Um, I would just like to give you the opportunity to you know close if you like with any um, things that come anything that comes to your mind, any anything you'd like to say to the audience, or something that is particularly um, worthwhile to to leave this discussion on? Um, sure. Well, you know, Abe, I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's, it's been fun and stimulating, and this is a, this is a, a very um, enjoyable area of practice for that, for that reason. For the person going into the cannabis uh, business, you know, anyone at, at this time is going in there a first mover. Uh-huh. Um, and a first mover in any industry is, is looking at um, – resolving and dealing with issues that later movers will not have to, and that's just part of the risk. That's part of the time and expenses right. involved. Right. This industry is absolutely that's the case. And for anyone who wants to get involved, um, it's a good time to get involved because I think there is money to be made. Um, this is a, you know, cannabis. If you're an advocate like I am, I think it's a good thing to push forward. That being said, there are a lot of regulations. There are a lot of contradictory laws. There is risk involved. And I think it's important to talk to a lawyer um, that you – feel that you can trust and that you feel like is on top of the, uh, of the game and make sure you follow your lawyer's recommendations because right now it is uh, a good time but also a risky time to get involved. Wow. Excellent. So, you know, the cost benefit of any kind of exciting venture um, should be weighed carefully. But if you do if you do it right under proper guidance, hopefully you will come out uh, stepping into this green rush with with the best of them. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Hope you be a, yeah, so. Uh, multi-millionaire and, and have pushed the cause and, and, and navigate the laws and so when everything is, it has evolved to the point where it's, it's legal and it's it's not so uh, controversial and gray yeah. area then, then you'd be, be, be living a life and we'll be happy. So, well, great. Um, thank well, you we're, again for having me. I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, so where can our listeners learn more about you and your practice and kind of get a hold of you? Yeah, thanks for asking. So, um, again, it's Rod Kite, R-O-D, and then Kite, K-I-G-H-T. There are two websites that I would point them to. One is uh, www.kitelaw.com. That's just K-I-G-H-T-L-A-W.com. The other, that's my general law practices website. The other area which is specific to the cannabis practice is um, my blog, which is kiteoncannabis.com. Uh-huh. That's K I G H T O N. C A N N A B I S dot com, Kite on Cannabis. So, hope you'll check out my uh, website and certainly my blog. I try to keep it updated with with all the the different things that, that are happening so rapidly in the cannabis industry and and, and, and keep people informed. So Fantastic, Ron. Thank you so much, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. That was very informative and, and helpful. Okay, thanks, Dave.